Robert Merton in the 1930s is rooted in the idea that society sets culturally approved goals and socially accepted means for achieving these goals. When individuals are unable to achieve these goals through legitimate means, they may feel strain or pressure. This strain can lead to feelings of frustration, inadequacy, and discontentment, which in turn can push individuals toward deviant behavior or criminal acts as an alternative means to achieve these goals. Do you have a passion for sharing captivating stories? Have you ever considered launching your own podcast or channel to bring content to life? Or maybe you were already an established content creator looking to increase your efficiency. If so, today's sponsor is a game changer for both current and aspiring content creators like you. Meet Avi, the ultimate voiceover cleanup solution tailored for content creators. Avi revolutionizes your content creation process, making it seamless and efficient. All you need to do is upload your raw audio file to Avi's platform, and their state-of-the-art AI technology will work its magic. Avi effortlessly removes pauses, duplicate words, and other imperfections, delivering perfect audio every time. And the best part is that it's free to try. I have personally used Avi and can confirm that it is a game changer. Making videos has never been easier. With Avi, you can focus on what truly matters, researching, scripting, and narrating the enthralling stories that keep your audience on the edge of their seats. Let Avi handle the technical side of things so you can unleash your creativity. Visit avi.ai to learn more and experience the magic of flawless audio. Link in the description below. Now let's dive back into the video. In today's video, we are going to look at Ronald Anthony Burgos. Take note that some call him Ronald while others call him Anthony. The sun rises over Laredo, Texas, casting a golden hue over the quiet town. Anthony, a border patrol agent of nine years, wakes up to the familiar sound of his alarm. He dresses in his uniform, preparing for another day at the Laredo North Station. As he leaves his home, there's no indication that this day will be any different from the others. At the station, Anthony attends the morning muster. Agents gather around, sipping their coffee, sharing jokes, and waiting for their assignments. Anthony is handed the keys to his Hilo unit, the white and green truck that's become a familiar sight in the area. He checks the vehicle, ensuring everything is in order before setting off. Anthony's destination for the day is off of Mines Road. It's a location he's patrolled many times before. As he drives, he passes familiar landmarks, nodding to locals along the way. Unbeknownst to many, Anthony has made plans to meet someone at the park, a young woman, someone he's been seeing in secret. Along with her is a child, their child. The park is just a meeting point. Their actual rendezvous is set in a secluded, brushy area near the Rio Grande River. She begins her walk, passing by the baseball field, following a nature trail and circling a soccer field. With every step, she gets closer to the river area, the location of their secret meeting. As the woman pushes a stroller along the path, she spots the familiar kilo unit parked ahead. It's a sight that should bring comfort, but little does she know, it's all part of a sinister plan. Anthony, using his knowledge of the area, has set up the perfect ambush. Anthony's patrol vehicle, the Kilo unit, is strategically parked at the end of the trail, serving as a decoy. Unbeknownst to her, Anthony is hiding nearby, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. The serene morning atmosphere is shattered when he ambushes her at around 9.45 a.m. The next few minutes are a blur of horror. The young woman, in a desperate bid to protect her child, fights back with all her might. But Anthony's attack is relentless. He brutally stabs her 27 times, leaving her almost unrecognizable. The evidence will later reveal defensive wounds on her hands, a testament to her fierce resistance. But the nightmare doesn't end there. With the mother incapacitated, Anthony turns his attention to the innocent child, Dominic. The 18-month-old, possibly confused and terrified, becomes his next target. In a chilling act, Anthony takes the child deeper into the brush, closer to the river. Holding the baby, he commits an unspeakable act, ending the young life. The aftermath is a scene of chaos and bloodshed. Anthony perhaps realizes the gravity of his actions, begins to stage the crime scene. He tries to make it appear as if smugglers had attacked the woman. He disposes of evidence, including the woman's phone and the baby's toy. 
He throws the stroller into the brush and scatters the women's belongings. However, in his haste, he makes a mistake. Blood evidence, particularly from the baby, is found on the back tailgate of his patrol vehicle. The crime scene tells a tale of a violent struggle with blood trails indicating the mother's desperate attempt to escape. Anthony's actions after the crime further incriminate him. He's seen on a security camera driving erratically near the World Trade Bridge. When he encounters fellow Border Patrol agents, he fiends ignorance, asking about the area where the bodies lay. He then makes a call about a subject down, initiating a charade of discovering the bodies. At the harrowing crime scene, Anthony urgently beckons investigators for assistance. As the officer approaches the park, he's unaware of Anthony's deeper connection to this tragic event that unfolded. The sight that greets him is haunting. Anthony stands by a stroller, his gaze fixed on a baby boy. The officer interprets Anthony's ashen face as shock, attributing it to Anthony's unfamiliarity with such grim situations involving children. However, the truth is more complex. Anthony recognizes the baby. As the area is blocked off and paramedics are summoned, the officer observes subtle, unsettling behaviors from Anthony. In time, the officer will recount his interactions with Anthony on that fateful day, detailing the chilling discoveries at the scene. Capacity as a supervisor, what is his statement in reference to? It's in reference to uh, the discovery of... Well, read what, read what it says. Okay. Um, I was working my assigned duties. I was driving by Father Magnable Park, when I met up with BPA Lara, about one minute, one minute later, I called him to assist me with the subject laying on the ground. When he showed up, we went to the subject and tapped her to see if she was conscious. I then called EMS to respond. We made a sweep of the area and found a stroller and another um, later on and he scratches out the uh, body. The Dominic uh, is found. And let me ask you specifically, where was Mr. Burgos uh, standing when baby Dominic was found? Um, when baby Dominic was found, he was standing um, by the border patrol trucks. Okay. And how do you know? Because I, I saw him. Okay. And. Uh, was there any more exchange with him at that point? Um, no, but uh, when it came time for me to go down and uh, and see Dominic, um, I followed a trail that we designated for authorized personnel uh, to take um, to Dominic. And um, I remember as I as I approached Dominic, I heard footsteps behind me. Um, I wasn't expecting anybody to follow me, uh, but when I turned around, it was um, Burgos. And what was he doing? Uh, when I turned around and looked at him, he was, he had this, uh, he had a pale face, his eyes were wide open, and he was just looking at Dominic. Um, I thought at the time that um, he might not he might not ever have seen um, a dead baby before. Um, he was holding a, the voluntary statement in his hand, so I told him, hey, go back to the uh, trucks and finish your statement there. Um, uh, he asked a third time, yes, he did ask a third time whether we had identified the bodies, and um, he said that his supervisors were asking for that information, and I told him no. Um, and after that uh, interaction, I, I didn't see him again. You stay there with the I, I stayed there where, where the bodies were located, yes. And by this time, Mr. Burgos is gone? Uh, yes. Okay. What I experienced was a, a rush of adrenaline, I, I believe, um, because all the odd behaviors that I was catching uh, finally had, to me, an explanation. Um, I also felt, um, I felt uh, a sense of urgency to let our personnel know uh, about that information because um, he is a uniformed uh, 
Border Patrol agent, and he did have a gun with him. So my concern was officer safety also. So what actions do you take, uh, if any? Um, I relay over the radio that um, letting them know that that was the person uh, that found uh, the body. How do you say it, if you recall? Um, he's the one that found the body. And do you, what other orders do you give over the radio? I also ask if anybody has a visual of him uh, because I didn't. Um, and he wasn't in the area where I was. The tragic story has roots in the past. Griselda, the young woman, had met Anthony in 2015. Their secret relationship resulted in the birth of Dominic. Despite being the father, Anthony never took responsibility for the child. Griselda's dreams of becoming a nurse, inspired by her older sister, Angelica, were cut short by this tragic event. The evidence, the testimonies, and the blood trails will play a crucial role in this trial. The community is left in shock, grappling with the horrifying reality of a trusted law enforcement officer committing such a heinous crime. The atmosphere in Laredo grows tense as the investigation into the crime unfolds. A supervisor on the scene reveals that Anthony is their prime suspect, primarily due to a bloody glove found in the back of his kilo unit. This revelation shocks many as the day's events had been shrouded in uncertainty. It isn't until 6.30 in the evening that the gravity of this situation truly sinks in for those involved. Anthony is subsequently arrested in the parking lot at the park. The leader informs him that the Border Patrol Union has already arranged lawyers for him, anticipating the need for legal representation. Anthony, widely regarded as a respected patrol officer, shoulders supervisory responsibilities with pride. His mandate is clear safeguard civilians, and uphold the principles of peace and justice. Yet the events that transpire on that ill-fated day at the park unveil a shadowy side to Anthony, one that few could have anticipated. This revelation not only shatters the lives of the affected families, but also casts a long, dark shadow over the entire Border Patrol department. Another patrol officer, a colleague, and perhaps once a friend, takes the stand. His testimony is charged with emotion as he recounts the moment he learned of Anthony being the prime suspect. The weight of the betrayal is evident, his face etched with disbelief and sorrow. It's a poignant reminder of the profound impact of one's actions, especially when they come from someone expected to possess an unwavering moral compass. One of the supervisors on scene had told me that he was their prime suspect. At the time, I thought it was because of the bloody glove that I put in the back of his kilo. I did not have confirmation that he was actually the main suspect until around 6.30 that night when another detective um, pretty much told me. The whole day I had my phone on me. As far as I can work at the police station, I was getting calls and texts, and I would just glance at it, put it down, glance at it, put it down. Somebody's texting me, put it down. I didn't think nothing of it. After we're done with our questioning, about five hours later, around 6, 6.30, when I'm released from the interview room, I go to the lobby of the police station. I am sitting next to Border Patrol Agent Herndon. I get a phone call from my team leader. My team leader tells me, hey, we already activated the Border Patrol Union, uh, the lawyers for you. Uh, before you make any statements, we already got lawyers. And I'm like, we already made our official statement. He was surprised. He's like, oh, you did? I'm like, yes. He's like, before he hangs up, he's like, just so you know, there's a rumor saying that the dead woman at Burgos' side chick. I'm like, all right, 10 4, let me call you back. I told Agent Herndon, hey bro, there's a rumor saying that the dead woman at Burgos is, I use the word Sancha. At that moment, we're talking, another detective comes out, a big man, I know him as a boxer. He comes out and I tell him, I still have my phone in my hand, I tell him, I, I tell him, sir, we just heard a rumor that the dead woman is Burgos' a side chick. The detective said, side chick, that's, that's his baby mama. And there's a possibility that the dead boy is his son. 
that's when everything just I broke down as a word everything just I felt like this weight on my shoulder and I started crying because I am thinking <laughs> I'm good, sir. Here I'm thinking we're supposed to be the good guys. He's supposed to be watching my back. Hold on. Give me one second. Sir. And that broke. I was heartbroken. One second, agent. Just going to uh, question and answer basis, Mr. I'm good, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. I was heartbroken. One second, sir. Yes, Your Honor. As the investigation continued, the investigator came into contact with several Border Patrol agents, including their supervisor, Anthony. Anthony was the one who discovered the body. The investigator noticed Anthony's peculiar demeanor. He seemed fixated on the body, taking deep breaths and avoiding eye contact. When questioned, Anthony mentioned that he tried to check if the woman was breathing, but denied dragging the body. The crime scene was secured with yellow tape, and the investigator, along with the CSI team, began their meticulous examination. The quest for the truth and justice is paramount and every piece of evidence and testimony is crucial in piecing together the puzzle of this tragic event. Griselda's sister steps up to the stand, her demeanor a mix of sorrow and determination. She paints a vivid picture of Griselda's life, portraying her as a resilient single mother of two, grappling with the challenges that come her way. The financial strain of raising two children is evident, with the escalating costs of childcare and essential baby products. During these testing times, Griselda leans heavily on her family, drawing strength and support from them. The narrative takes a turn when Griselda's sister delves into the intricacies of government assistance. To secure this aid for her children, Griselda finds herself compelled to open a child support case against Anthony, a stipulation set by the authorities. The tension escalates as it's revealed that mere weeks have passed since the initiation of this case. Anthony, seemingly eager to discuss the matter, reaches out to Griselda for a meeting. The courtroom listens intently as Griselda's sister delves deeper, recounting text exchanges between the two sisters. Griselda's request to borrow her sister's car for the impending meetup with Ronald becomes a focal point of the testimony. Oh no, my reply is yes to when she asks, so can I borrow it? My reply is yes to her. And then she responds at a park by Winfield public place so I can so he can play he referring to Dominic uh, she responds I'm freaking out laugh out loud I'm going to take a shower real quick text you once I'm out I don't think my response to her I don't think it's a good idea and it looks like there are some emojis next to it those little black um, squares and then, um, but I put, but yes, you can borrow it. Hold on there. So why are you saying it's not a good idea? Well, because they just had a, you know, huge argument prior to this, after February, when she submitted her documents for child support. And from her words to me was that he was very upset. He was very angry. He didn't want to speak to her again. He said he was never going to go through with it. He blocked her from social media, from, you know, her accounts, from her phone, everything. And then all of a sudden, that's why I'm asking her, you know, is this a good idea? Because all of a sudden he wants to meet her. He wants to meet her. I didn't know it was a park until she tells me in the text it was a park. But I, you know, I wanted it to be a public place. I'm thinking, you know, maybe they're going to start arguing. So I want to make sure it's somewhere public where if she needs help, there's people watching that can help. Okay, so you're concerned about her safety? Yes. While at the park, a distressed Griselda reaches out to her friend over the phone, seeking solace after the tense encounter with Anthony. The weight of Anthony's lack of support and his harsh words weigh heavily on her. As the courtroom listens with bated breath, Griselda's friend takes the stand, 
Recounting the details of that poignant phone call, she vividly describes the alarming threats Anthony made that day, casting a shadow over the events that transpired. From what I remember, I don't remember the whole conversation. Um, I just remember her calling me crying. Okay, let's talk about that. She calls you crying. Yes. Please tell the jury what was her emotional state when she called. She was crying. She was really emotional, very... Uh, she was angry that um, she had gone to the park. She was regretting her going. She was, she was crying on this conversation? Yeah, she, she was just crying and crying. What kind of things was she, was she saying? She was just saying that, um, well, I can hear the baby crying in the background. Um, she was just like, um, that she was regretting going over to go meet up with Anthony. That um, it didn't go as planned. She just wanted him to see the baby, you know, to have a little relationship, you know, just to meet him. Um, and, you know, talk about the child support, um, and he had said something along the lines with, um, me vas a odiar por lo que voy a hacer, meaning you're going to okay. hate. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm not sure about you Do I keep on? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no I'm going to ask you. What you're going to hate me for what I'm going to do. Is that accurate to what the translator just said? Yes. You're going to hate me for what I'm about, what I'm going to do? Yes. And And what, what if anything, do you say or do? Well, I told her that she sh that sounded like a threat, so she should put um, a restraining order against him. That was your advice, for her to go get a restraining order? Yes, I told her to, and just to be careful, to be careful and, and not to meet up with him again. Well, that was around that time. Did she ever go and get a restraining order? Not, not that I know of, no. Griselda, with her son in tow, returns home. A cloud of worry evident on her face. The baby boy's discomfort is palpable prompting her sister, a trained nurse, to examine him. To her alarm, she finds a bleeding wound on his leg. The sight of the unusual dark blood raises concerns, especially since Griselda confirms the baby hasn't had any recent vaccinations. A wave of panic sweeps over Griselda, and without a moment's hesitation, they rush the baby to the emergency room. I see her with my nephew in, in her arms, and he's crying. He's as soon as I open the door, he's saying, Awi, Awi, where she's carrying him. So I'm thinking, you know, something's wrong with him the way she's holding him. So I said, what's wrong with him? Why, why is he crying? And, he, and she just said, maybe he needs a nap. He's just been fuzzy since, since the park, and that's why I had to leave. So I said, okay, well, come on in and lay down in the sofa with him and see if he'll, you know, go to sleep and he'll, he'll feel better. So she's like, okay, in my house, in the living room, it's always kind of, you know, dim, so it's everybody falls asleep easily in the living room so she takes them on to the sofa and she lays with them there and maybe about 25 minutes later I I can still hear him moaning and just being uncomfortable so at this point I tell her you know what and I can hear him saying owie to her still owie owie mama owie so I tell her bring Dominic to the room let me check him so I I get she I grab him from her arms and I lay him down right on my bed and I start checking him from head to toe. My mom, whenever my children, or when I'm the oldest from my brothers and sisters, whenever something was wrong with us, she'd always, you know, lay us down and check us to make sure nothing was wrong with us. So I do the same thing. I start taking off his clothes pieces one by one, and when I put on his little shorts, he wears a diaper at this time. You know, he's a year and a half, so he wears a diaper. I pulled on his shorts, and then when I go to pull him down, you know, his legs look they look normal to me at first sight and then I flip him this way to see his right thigh it looks okay his leg looks okay but when I flip him to on his right side that I used to see his left leg I see um, a dot of blood on his thigh right on his vastus lateral right on his thigh where you would get like a, a shot when the babies get shots from the doctors 
So my first, as I'm checking him, I'm talking to my sister right next to me, and I'm asking her, "Have you taken him? Have you taken him in for shots lately?" Because I noticed that as soon as I moved him and I went to check his leg, he starts, "Howie, howie!" Like he now he's crying. Now he's not just saying "howie." Now he's crying. So I'm telling her, you know, when did you take him for shots? And she's like, I just see her eyes like wide open. She's like, I haven't taken him for shots. I, I haven't taken him. He hasn't gotten any shots. At that moment, when I ask her, she just goes into straight panic because then she starts telling me like, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with him? What? And I just tell her, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me check. And like, I'm trying to calm her down because she's screaming. She's frantic. She's just freaked out and I'm checking Dominic and when I go to wipe the area with my hand where he had the the blood on it the little scab whatever had formed it wipes off and then we start seeing black like his blood was not red it was like very dark like a brown blackish color let me ask you though is she crying she's at this point she's already crying and screaming and my kids can hear her in the sala and they all kind of rush in the room I feel that's why she went into panic mode because she, she did leave him alone with his father for momentarily, I don't know how long. Um, she tells me that she went to the car to get the sippy cup and some snacks that she had for him. And on her way back, Dominic's father is facing the park and he is holding the Domin Dominic on a bench. And I imagine he was holding him like this because that's what she modeled to me when she was showing me. And she hears the, his dad speaking to him about him being present in his life because he doesn't want Dominic to go through what he went through when he was small, that he was raised by his grandmother. And he's going to be there for Dominic and, you know, he's going to be present in his life. So my sister tells me that she took a while to get to him to allow them to have that, you know, moment. The bond. Yes. And when she starts a she starts walking a little faster because she starts hearing Dominic kind of cry or, or I don't know, be uneasy. But after, after March 25th, after that day, he, he went from being a normal 18 month old, I can run, you know, everything, walk to not being able to walk anymore. Uh, days after, if I'm not mistaken, it was on March 29th, I received a text message from my sister asking if she could borrow my walker that we used for our children when they were about nine months old, when they were learning to walk, because my nephew could no longer walk. Um, Allegedly, Anthony administers some kind of injection to the baby that fateful day. As the investigation unfolds, the discovery of needles in Anthony's truck lends to these suspicions. It's believed that this act was Anthony's initial attempt to eliminate the baby boy from the equation. However, when the ejections didn't achieve the desired outcome, Anthony, in a chilling turn of events, took more drastic measures to erase both the baby and Griselda from his life. In a dimly lit interrogation room, Anthony sits across from two investigators. The investigators, with calculated intent, begin to describe the crime scene in vivid detail, emphasizing the sheer amount of blood present. Their words paint a picture, hoping to unsettle him and make him slip. However, Anthony remains unfazed. He leans forward, his voice steady, and begins recounting his version of events. He describes stumbling upon the woman and the baby. He states that he did not recognize the victims. Anthony's narrative takes a curious turn when he starts discussing two shoes he found at the scene. He describes them in detail, emphasizing how he relocated them to different spots. The investigators exchange glances, finding it odd that amidst the horror of the scene, Anthony's focus seems to be primarily on these two shoes. His insistence on this detail raises eyebrows. The room grows colder as the investigators ponder why, out of everything he witnessed, Anthony is so fixated on the whereabouts of these two seemingly insignificant shoes. <clears throat> so in this particular situation, I mean, you know, you're not seeing that she's passed out because of pee exposure, you see, because it's yes. blood, blood force trauma. Um, and it's pretty clear. You know, from the moment that I show up, blood force trauma, as well as I saw people in the same place. I mean, when there's blood everywhere, you know, you're in a blood pool of blood. Usually that's a sign that... I mean, that was a discussion that we had with you and with Lana, 
And with Smith was like, hey, there's blood here, there's blood here, there's blood here. Like, well, let's make the crime scene bigger. Well, that was them. That was, that was, that was that one that was making those calls because, like I said, he's the one that did not so many more. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, we agreed with him when we showed yeah. up. We were there 10 I, seconds before we said, wow, there's blood. At the time when I was there, I didn't know it was, it was, it was drama, but the trauma, I, I, I didn't know that shit. You know? But if you were saying is that just by looking at it, you know that it's a serious, it is, serious it is, injury, it whatever, whether it's a. You know, she laughs on the head, or whether, yeah. you know, she was assaulted with something else. That's and all I'm saying. And you, sh- and you, you know? know, I should have known that she was there. I'd say you should have known she was there, yeah. You made it sound like you were like, oh, come on, man. You should have known that. Like, yeah, you should have known that, that it was pretty dang serious. I mean, you were serious, right. but I told you, they don't want to put in the radio that somebody did, you know, right. because I'm like, okay, we, we got that. We clarified that. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, both of us, you guys move her a couple of times, remember? Yeah. Did you get to look at her? Did you say, I, 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 did you hear say at one point, who's this email? You know, look, I'm trying to show you how far we move people like this. You know, it was, and then her hair was down and all that shit, you know. So that, that was a failed attempt. You said, okay, you rid of them. You know, I, yeah, I'm kind of messing with this situation. At that time, I did. At that time, I And then what happened next? The more we moved, the more. Did you get through What happened next? We did a sweep. What is it? Like we went into like the surrounding areas, mm-hmm. like just in case it was, I don't know, somebody. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Uh, in your separate directions, or yeah, yeah. one direction they went in another direction. Yeah. yeah, okay. And then what what happened with your sweep? We found shoes, which I, I, I found shoes. I didn't think anything of it. I think you know, I found shoes all the time from from the from yeah, I mean, they came and just grabbed it. Looked at it to make sure I didn't look over there, put it down on the stroller. Same thing, you know, I looked at it, I grabbed it, whatever. They didn't get anything of it. They continued to sweep, sweep, sweep. We went back, there was another shoe looking at the same one that I found. And that's the one that, you know, we found both shoes? Yeah, that's the one I was like, you know what? This shoe here looks like the other one. And it was like pretty cold, so I grabbed it. And I put it down the dirt road, and that was that black one that was there. You and grab, you grab both shoes. The first one I grabbed, and I didn't think anything of it because it was like far away. It was like I maybe mean, like 15, 20 feet away. Okay, so the furthest so, shoe so, you grabbed. So that one I grabbed it, but it was like 20, 20, 30 feet away. Don't fucking quote me on it. Like I'm freaking, like I'm giving you exact distances because I'm just giving you so you can visualize it, right? Didn't think anything of it. I put it down, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Walk back. In one sweep area, all the stuff. Found the stroller, didn't get anything of it again, because like I said, there's always trash all over that place. Went back to Rada, and I told him what I saw. And wait, actually, where he was at, in that area of the brush, that's where I saw the other shoe. He didn't see what I saw. It. And I grabbed it, and I was like, this is like the other shoe, man. And he said, like, you might be hers, man, because you don't know, she, she's missing two shoes. He leans in closer expressing genuine curiosity about Anthony's perspective on the incident and any suspicions he might have regarding the perpetrator. The silence stretches, tension building with each passing moment. The investigator's patience starts to wane. His demeanor shifts from understanding to frustration, and he leans in even closer, pressing Anthony for more information, eager to get to the heart of the matter. To be honest with you, to me, Seeing somebody in there, all I have to be suspicious about, about, about uh, a female with a stroller in there, you know, about a fine. It's really, there's well, really zero suspicion in that area. Well, you all discovered the shoes and the stroller began the racket. I can't, I can't remember. I know the EMS was there, man. I can't remember if he had arrived or he was just getting there. I know the helicopter was flying. Do you think that situation where you discover body, shoes, stroller, but uh, that situation kind of heightened your concern, like, oh man, this is, this is bad. You know, they then a call, like, we need to set up the perimeter, whatever, there's a bad guy's in there, you know. You know, it looks like a very bad situation. I, I had a, I, yeah, I had already told the guys to sell the perimeter, or, <laughs> or perimeter turning to a perimeter search. Well, you guys were kind of turning her over and, you know, doing what you could for her, you know, went outside. Um, was there any attempt to identify her to see who she was? No. That kind of curious to you is like, who's this woman? To me, man, I was at the time, I was just like, I need more of a trust. All right, so you, you, 
it's in the business, it's normal for you, right? Because you see this a lot. So let's get back to that because I don't think you're going to say, I mean, that's what your story is. So let's get past, how did you end up, why did you end up over there where the car was? There was, uh, there was, a, there was one of you guys, one of the older guys. Mm -hmm. who, you, who is it? I'm not sure. Who do you think it is? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not I think sure. you got something going right there, there, you know, uh, that you want to get off your chest. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure if you want to be sure. Or do you think that it was somebody that resembles the person? Who do you think it would be? It's not that it's not that it resembles somebody because I do not see the person. Okay, the card, the card resembles yes, something. The, 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 the card that we're saying is it kind of like rings a bell. Okay. But I don't want to say anything because right. I, I don't want to say for a fact. No, but maybe yeah. that's for us to verify if it's true or not. You, all we're asking for is, you know, your opinion. Who, who well, the car look like? I don't want to give you my opinion on that because I don't know for sure. I don't want to be saying this. Shit. No, well, what we say here is stupid no, unless you lie to us. No, no, no. What okay. I mean, what I mean, how are we saying, you know, how do I say this? What do you think the car belongs to the bus? What do you think it belongs to? We've seen it before. Yeah, I saw it last. So today, whose car is it? I don't know whose car is it. What do you think it is? I mean, based on your being earlier, you think it's someone's car. I don't know whose car it is. I mean, he, he's being a little more patient, man. I'm, I'm going to lose my patience here with you real quick, man. Uh, yeah, because I want you to, to, to be honest with us. We brought you a chance. You know, gave you a chance to come here and tell us the truth about everything that happened today. We don't really know a lot more than you think we know. We know who came in from the cameras. We know what time the car got out there. We know what time you went in. You know, we got two vehicles that were parked that were pulled into that place. Right? The owner of the car, and we know who she is. You know who she is. You have a baby with her. So, I mean, we want to know, we want to know. Now you tell me, explain that to me. I have a baby with who? Well, you tell me, who you have a baby with? Uh, you said that. You said you have a baby with her. Right? With her. Right. With her. Well, you tell me. Uh, I'm asking you. I don't know who's her. You tell me. Who's her? Who's the car? Whose car is it? Well, you're asking me a question, but I don't want the answer. If you want, if you want to ask me something. Okay, cool. Okay, let me ask you this. Are you married? Yes. Okay. Do you have do you have a baby with another girl? I don't know. I can't you That's a stupid answer. You mean you mean you mean What do you mean you don't know? Do you have us or no, but there's no playing around with this. You know, we're talking a double homicide. Do you have a baby with someone else? Yes or no? We simply. Yeah. You gotta make it easier for someone else. You gotta make it easier for someone else. It makes the situation worse. I know where you're going. But the yes or no questions, if, if it, it's it's not that simple. It's not like, it's not like I gotta tell you. What? Well, yes or no? Mira, listen, asking you if you have a baby with someone other than your wife is a yes or no. I'm not going to judge you. I don't give a damn. I'm just asking you, do you have a job with somebody else? Anthony's demeanor shifts abruptly. His eyes narrow, and he accuses the investigators of trying to manipulate him, of speaking in circles. The atmosphere grows even more charged, with both Anthony and the lead investigator visibly puffing up, a silent battle of wills playing out before them. Recognizing the escalating situation, the second investigator steps in, attempting a different approach. He subtly shifts focus to Anthony's reputation, hinting at the implications this case might have on his standing. But Anthony remains guarded. His growing frustration is evident in the way he repeatedly strokes his head. His movement becomes more frantic with each passing moment. The room is thick with tension, a silent standoff between Anthony and the investigators. Stop playing like, the little you're the one that's not telling us the truth. What do you think? You think that all of this stuff is coincidence? You're the one, you're the strong man, you're the one that finds her, and then the little one-year-old, what happened was found, found right across from her, right? Uh -huh. 
They were two of the years that were in the park. I was supposed to be shit, no one. The last time I talked to her, what's about, maybe like a week ago, she was like, oh, I can get you some drinks. I was like, yeah, 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 societal pressures can lead individuals to commit crimes. When people feel they cannot achieve societal goals through legitimate means, they might resort to illicit methods. The societal expectation to provide, coupled with the perceived inability to meet these expectations, could have driven him to take drastic measures. The strain of not living up to societal standards, especially in a role as pivotal as fatherhood, can push individuals to the brink, leading them to make choices they wouldn't under normal circumstances. In the context of Reynolds' situation, the societal goal might be the expectation to provide for one's family, especially in a role as pivotal as fatherhood. The strain theory becomes even more relevant when considering the added complexities of Anthony's marital status and the desire to keep the baby a secret. In many societies, marriage is not just a personal commitment, but also a societal institution laden with expectations and norms. The strain arises when there's a disparity between societal expectations and individual realities. Being married, Anthony would be under the societal pressure to maintain the sanctity and image of his marriage. The existence of a child outside of this marriage would be a direct contradiction to these societal norms and expectations, but also potentially strain his marital relationship, leading to further societal judgment. The financial obligation in the form of child support becomes not just a monetary strain, but also a constant reminder of his dual life. Every payment, every interaction related to the child becomes a potential point of exposure adding to the strain. The strain theory suggests that Anthony's actions might have been a desperate attempt to alleviate the overwhelming pressure and strain caused by the clash between societal expectations, his marital obligations, and the reality of his secret child. The weight of maintaining the secret coupled with the financial and emotional responsibilities toward the child could have pushed him towards extreme measures as a way to resolve the strain and restore a sense of order in his life. Anthony was convicted of two counts of murder, and he was sentenced to two life sentences without the possibility of parole. Do you think Anthony actually thought he would get away with the crime? Or was this all rage and not a cover-up? 
We want to give a big thanks to everyone over on Patreon. We want to give a big shout out to Nexus, Big Pepperoni Pizza, Chrissy R, Catherine D, Tony S, Tiffany D, Dolce P, and Emily H. If you want to watch ad-free and uncensored versions of all Wicked videos, feel free to join our Patreon. Link in the description. Thank you for watching and join us next time when we explore the psychological maze of some of the most wicked people.